Hello, friends, and welcome to the Wisdom for Life broadcast. This is Pastor Glenn with another episode that we hope will bless you. Okay, so we're, we're going to talk, we're going to do a little teaching tonight about how Jesus is in the entirety of the Bible. If you want a hermeneutic for the Bible, the proper hermeneutical lens of Scripture is Jesus. All of Scripture is about Jesus. I'm not making that up. That's not just my opinion. That's not just something that I favor in reading Scripture. That is something that is a fact, that it's true. And it's so true that it came out of the mouth of our Lord and Savior Himself. So when you read the Old Testament, I'm going to show you tonight, we're just going to go through major parts of the Old Testament. In fact, um, uh, just the book of Genesis, actually. And I do have a handout as well, if, if some folks wouldn't mind too much. Maybe I could get you folks to help me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> But I want you to see that Jesus is in the entirety of the Bible. We're just going to look at some major parts of the Old Testament, uh, really in Genesis, to show you that it's really all about Jesus. And actually, our Lord and Savior says this. He tells us this in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. He says this. uh, He says, Jesus said that everything written about me must happen, right? He says in this verse, everything in three parts. I want you to notice these three parts in this text. Everything in the law of Moses. Say everything, if you would. Okay, so that doesn't mean just like, just like some parts or just a few parts. Everything means everything. You look up the Greek word for everything, and guess what? It means everything. Okay? So everything in the law of Moses, in the books of the prophets, and the Psalms. And then the Bible says that Jesus then opened their minds so that they could understand the Scriptures. How many of you know that our minds need to be opened to understand the Scriptures? But the beginning of our minds being opened in the understanding of the Scriptures is understanding that what the Scriptures are talking about are Jesus. That they're talking about Jesus. And and so there's three major elements to the Old Testament. There's three major divisions. I'm not making this up either. This isn't, you know, this isn't stuff out of seminary, $20 word stuff. This is stuff from Jesus. So I want you to see there's three major parts, okay? The first part is the law of Moses. That's called the Torah. The Torah is... In Hebrew means instruction. So that's the first five books of the Old Testament. That's the Torah, instruction, right? This was all uh, comprised together in the canon by Jesus' day. If you want to know what the disciples, the apostles uh, later read, and what they wrote their scriptures off of in their letters, epistles, and that sort of thing, they wrote them based off the Old Testament. That's the only Bible they had at that time. Okay, so we're all fortunate to have this kind of like um, uh, this bias that kind of looks back and says, I've got 66 books, but they didn't have 66 books at the time. They had the Old Testament. And part of the first major division of the Old Testament is the Torah instruction. The second part is the Nevium, the Nevium. That's another part of the Old Testament. There's just three. And so he says everything about from the law of Moses and also the book of the prophets So all the prophetic books in the Old Testament are speaking of whom? Help me out, church. They're speaking of Jesus. Okay? So so we know that it's all leading to to Jesus. So the major and the minor prophets, when you you go to read the minor prophets, don't think that um, that what they did was any smaller or any less in degree. We just call it minor prophets because those books are, are, are actually shorter books. But we, you know, we say major and minor, but these are just names we put on stuff. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, and the next one is the Ketavim. The Ketavim is the writings. That's where you're going to get Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalms. That's where uh, uh, Song of Solomon. These are the writings. So three major divisions. And where does this idea come from? Jesus. Jesus said, everything written in these three divisions are written about whom? Jesus. Me. All right. So here's what I want you to stop doing. I want you to stop having conversations with people where they start to say, well, that Old Testament is past. No, it's not. And I'm going to show you some some of the I'm going to give you some caveats here. And I'm going to I'm going to show you some of the misconceptions that we make about the Old Testament and the New. Because we look at the New Testament and we think, well, that's just something brand new. God popped it out of nowhere. No, the Old Testament covenant goes all the way back to Abraham and God. If you remember, Abraham slept while God walked through the middle of those five animals that were split in half. God did the performance. God did the work. Abraham slept. Doesn't that sound like faith and grace? 
So the plan of God never changed. We do have some elements that came to the Hebrew people. I'm going to teach you what those are. But those, most of those were fulfilled in Christ. And I'll give you the reasons why as well. But these three areas in the Old Testament are called the Tanakh. T-N-K. That's an acronym. Okay. At that time, the Hebrew people did not use vowels. Vowels were added later. So they pronounced things like vowels were there. So the Tanakh represents T, Torah, N, Nevi'im, K, Kedivim. You see? That's all of the Old Testament. So Jesus might have well just came out and said, all of the Old Testament is talking about me. There you go. Right? So anytime somebody says, I'm not an Old Testament Christian, well, then you're not about Jesus. You know? Okay, cool. I think you got that. Great. So... There are some misconceptions, though, we make when we turn from the Old Testament to the New. And I want to give you some of the common ones here, okay? Because we think God is different. And by the way, when I was a kid, we used to have a little Cracker Jack type toy that, uh, I don't know if you ever, if you had a magic shop somewhere when you were a kid or you could buy some. Well, there was a, there was a coin that my dad bought me one time. And this coin had the same, he bought me two. One had uh, tails on both sides and the other one had heads on both sides. And so whenever I was hanging out with my friends, I'm like, whoa, let's flip on it, you know? And I'd pull out a coin. They wouldn't have one. I'm like, oh, okay, come on, you know? You call it. And they'd say, well, it's heads. Well, I'd keep heads in the left pocket, right? And I'd keep tails in the right. Oh, you called it, okay. And then I'd pull out the appropriate coin, you know? I'd, I'd flip the opposite of what they called, and I'd always win, you know? Well, it, it worked a few times until word got out that don't flip a coin with Glenn. When you open your Bible, you're seeing both sides of the same coin you're not seeing heads and tails you're seeing just heads on both sides but they're written from a different perspective and that's what trips people up so one of the common misconceptions is this that the old testament is a god of wrath but in the new testament it's a god of grace and mercy and that couldn't be farthest from the truth Uh, when you do an appropriate bible study you'll begin to realize and understand that there's plenty god of, of wrath in the new testament a whole lot. Let, 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 me, let me give you an example here. How about 2 Thessalonians 1 6? It says, God is just. He will pay back trouble for those who trouble you. Hmm. And give relief to those who are troubled. And to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish. Oh, there's the word punish. That's an Old Testament word, is it not? In the New Testament. That's weird. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're going to change that word gospel to good news. That's what it means. God spell good news. All right. So he's going to punish people who don't obey the good news. All right. That's a combination of both testaments right there. And then watch this verse nine. They will be punished with an everlasting destruction, shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. That's not Old Testament. That's new. Right. And one of the, one, another common misconception of the Old Testament and New is this. Uh, there's a God of the Old Testament that isn't very loving, but a God of the New Testament that is very loving. Well, I'm going to show you the God of the Old Testament was extremely loving. Okay? How about this for, for a second? Uh, Exodus chapter three, 34, verse 6. This, in explanation of God, says, God is merciful, merciful gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, faithfulness and keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin. That's seven things. Whenever you see seven in the Bible, that's completeness. All right? And God mentioned seven things in a row about his character. And he said, this is me. Merciful, forgiving, long-suffering, loving. Old Testament. Not new. All right? And then another one is that uh, the Old Testament is all about the law. I'm going to help you with the law a little bit because there's elements of the law that you need to understand. And hopefully you'll take down a little bit of this for your notes tonight. But um, there's some elements of the law that are still in operation today. And I know some of you are going to want to run to the doors right away because I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. Okay, well, two thirds of the law you're not under. They were fulfilled in Christ. But another part of the law you're empowered by the spirit to keep. Amen. Call the Ten Commandments. Jesus even made it a little bit simpler. He said, hey, all of it hangs on too. 
And if you think of the Ten Commandments, they really just represent two sets of laws or two relational dynamics. And the two of them together make a cross. One is a vertical relationship and the other one is a horizontal relationship. And so those two together are in this. When Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. He he says, this is is a commandment. Jesus doesn't doesn't like shy back and say, well, if you want to. He says, this is a commandment. A commandment is um, obligatory. You, You have to obey. All right? So you are under some law. But the law that we have that comes from Christ gives us his spirit to be able to be empowered to do it and by grace. So I want you to see what Jesus says here um, in Matthew chapter uh, 5 verse 17. He says, don't misunderstand why I've come. I didn't, I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses. Did you know Jesus said that? Yep. He said, I didn't come to, to abolish the law or the writings or the prophets. Now, what are those three things again? I just taught Tanakh, Tanakh. Can everybody say it together? He said, I didn't come to abolish the Old Testament. Woo! Now, now there's a lot of preachers that would want to get in a fight with me right, right then and there. They'd bypass the fried chicken and mashed potatoes just to tell me I'm wrong. But don't argue with me. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish it. Hello? No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear. Heaven and earth hasn't disappeared yet, folks. Hello? Now, don't, don't leave here with condemnation tonight and begin to think that you have to start following all of these Old Testament laws. I'm going to tell you in a second how bad the Pharisees made it. That, that, that's not what Jesus is saying. A majority of the law he fulfilled so that we don't have to. Amen? And I'll show you those areas, okay? But there are parts of the law that um, remain, and they remain for us to obey. He says, He says, so if you ignore the least of the commandment and teach others to do the same, you'll be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you'll still go to heaven, but you'll be sweeping the floors. All right? But anybody who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. There's so many preachers today out there telling people that the law is gone. Hell's best kept secret is the law. People don't repent today because they don't know there is a law. They don't know that God expects anything from them. They just think that God, which they got in a blue light special, in the greasy grace that came their way, that somehow is there to just save them for whatever decision they want to make. And not understanding that God gave his life so that we could live for him. So he gave his life so that we might be empowered to give our lives back to him. And that's not in their vocabulary because they haven't been taught the scriptures. He says, I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the first time I read that book, I was in a boy's home. I was uh, 14, 15. I, yeah. So I put myself in a boy's home. I ran away. Uh, I, was, I was gone for a whopping three days in the woods. Okay, But that's all it took back in the day to get shipped off and so here I am in the boys home and I I ended up with some apostolic boys home uh, parents right and uh, was that a trip (laughs) that was a trip for me okay it's pretty cool now because I love them and everything I still know them to this day they're good people Um, Glenda and John Hen wherever you are out there God bless you for what you did in my life but uh, while I was in the boys' home, I was reading this in my room one day, and Glenda came in the room and said, what's the matter? And I said, I'll never be any better than the Pharisees. I'm not going to heaven. There's no way I'll make it. And she says, you don't understand what that means. And I said, well, help me out, because I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty upset right now, you know? And she said, you know, uh, once you give your life to Christ, his life is going to be yours. And he's going to empower you by, your, by his spirit to begin to obey God. And I was like, really? That's, that's some hope because I had no idea. I, I, I had no idea that I would ever be able to obey anybody. I mean, at that time in my life, I mean, I was a, a juvenile delinquent, you know? That's what they, I mean, I was crazy. Still am a little bit. But, but you know, I recognized at that point that why God gave his life and his spirit so that I could become obedient. Oh, there's that word obey. Mm, mm. So there's three elements to the Old Testament law, and I want to give them to you very quickly. 
uh, two of them are fulfilled in Jesus. So when you read these things in the New Testament from Paul, when he starts to talk about how the law is passed or fulfilled in Christ and how we have now the law of the Spirit, what he's really referring to here is these two categories. One is very important, and the other one is just as important but not as important, okay? The first one is ceremonial law. That is all of the laws that included worshiping God and um, offering sacrifices to God. We don't do any of those things today. We don't have to because Hebrews tells us and Paul tells us in Romans and, and in Galatians that we have a more perfect sacrifice. We have a more perfect high priest. All of that stuff is fulfilled in Christ. So we don't have to follow those, those rules and regulations anymore to get to God. We have access to come to God into his throne room with boldness because of Jesus Christ and his perfect sacrifice. The other one is civil law. And uh, we don't follow most of the civil law today because it was written to Jewish people to protect them in a couple of ways. Let me give them to you. Number one was intermarriage. They were to be a people that, was, that were just married to Jews. This is not a bias. This is not a prejudice. It was to bring about the Messiah so that the bloodline of the Messiah on both sides okay, would be pure. All right, all of that prophecies had to be fulfilled. Some of the other laws, like you couldn't sew certain types of fabric together with other types of fabric, or you couldn't eat shellfish. What are all of these crazy rules? People think, I've got to do all this today. No, you don't. This was for Jewish people so that they would stand out because of the people that they lived around them, the Hittites, the, the uh, Amorites, the Arites, you know, all of these people that lived around them worshipped in pagan ways. And so when these pagan people began to worship in the way that they did, they'd look at the Jewish people and they'd say, well, why don't you eat cheese with meat? Why can't you eat that? And they'd say, well, because you're in your pagan worship, you're boiling a kid goat in its mother's milk. You, you understand? Or you're boiling a calf in its mother's milk. And that's a pagan uh, act of worship. And God wants us to be separate. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be consecrated. Those three words are synonymous, okay? All right? So these things break down for the Jewish people to be separate from the world. Why? Because they would be sent out into the world through diasporas. Slavery in Egypt, all right? Captivity in Babylon, Babylon and in Persia, and later under the Romans. And these people would begin to look at these peculiar people, as Peter mentions them, and say, you're odd, you're weird, you're strange. Why do you do that? Because we do this. And then Jewish people would go, yeah, and the way what you do is witchcraft. What you're doing is pagan and it's worshiping false gods. And so God has these, these, these laws in order for us so that we can show you the one true God. We don't have to worry about that today because Jesus has shown us who the one true God is perfectly. Why? Because he, he was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's what Colossians says, okay? What's left? The moral law. And we still have that today. We still have the Ten Commandments today. People say, well, we don't have the commandments anymore. That's not biblical. I'm sorry, that's not biblical. It's still against God's law to murder. It's still against God's law to lie. Even the New Testament says liars shall find their place in hell. Um, it's still against God's law uh, to commit adultery. But Jesus comes along and says, you've made it Pharisees and you Sadducees. You've made it all about the outside. I'm going to make it really about the heart. I'm going to say, even if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. Even if you call your brother a fool, or the Hebrew word is raka, uh, you have committed character assassination or murder. The same thing. He's saying, what's going on in your heart is even worse. So you see, if, if you want to abandon the moral law completely, understand that what Jesus calls you to is, is <laughs> far more demanding anyway. So where's the hope? The hope is that he gave his spirit, and that's what we find in the New Testament. The spirit in the Old Testament comes briefly upon people. The spirit in the New Testament comes and remains. And that's the big difference between the two. All right, Pastor Glenn, what else you got? You got anything else? I want to show you Jesus in Genesis, if I could. We're going to wrap things up, but I want to remind you that Psalms in the Old Testament says, 
in uh, Psalms 102, uh, verse 25, says, You are the same, and your years have no end. In other words, God, you are the same. Hebrews uh, tells us in 13.8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God is the same. So I want to show you Jesus just in Genesis. And I may not get through all this. You have the handout to take home if I don't, okay? Number one, the first word of the Bible. By the way, when you read the Torah, the Old Testament, um, each of the books of the Bible, has anyone ever taught you why they're named that way? So Genesis, why is it named Genesis? It's, it's what? Yeah, absolutely. Very good, very good. It's the actual Hebrew, the first word in Hebrew of that book. So each of the books of the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew word of that book that they use to call that book. So Genesis is actually the first word of Genesis. You say, what? No, I thought it was in. All right, well, now, (laughs) Hebrew language speaks a little bit like Yoda. You know, the prepositions are on the other end of the sentence. Come on. So when we say things in English, we expect it to be the same. And for you to have an English Bible and be able to read it correctly, you would would see, see in the beginning. But in the Torah, Genesis starts with Bereshit. Bereshit. You want to try it? You don't want to try it because of the sheet part, right? Okay, but barashit. This, this means beginning. And we put the word in the beginning, right? Well, I want to show you the first word of the Old Testament. And I want to give you the letters of the first word of the Old Testament. And I want to show you kind of a breakdown of how that worked, okay? Um, the etymology of the word alphabet, alphabet. Okay, that's not Greek, it's not Roman, it's Hebrew, it's Phoenician. All right, Aleph, Biet. That's the first two letters of the Hebrew language. Aleph, Biet. All right, so the two of those two come together and we get the word alphabet. All right, so I'm going to show you how these letters kind of work because at the time of the writing of the Torah, it, they were pictograms. Okay, a little bit like Egyptian hieroglyphics, pictograms. So not just, not just the letters arranged in the word had a meaning, but the actual letters as pictures lined up together had a meaning. Are you with me? You can see it in your handout. You're probably far ahead of me. But I'm going to take that word, Bereshit, right here, and I'm going to give you what it says. We've got two letters together, Bet or Biet, Resh. All right, those two together make the word sun. In the pictogram, you can see see a sun's head. Can you see that there in in the picture, in the illustration? That next part is house. That sun's head and house together, right? That head and house together means sun. Interesting. The next word is aleph, or next letter is aleph. That's an ox head, often used for God the Father. When God the Father was mentioned, Aleph in the Hebrew language is Abba, A, A, Aleph. You want to try that with me? Aleph, Abba, Abba. So when I say Abba, I'm saying strong father. He's strong like an ox because the first letter in his name would be an ox. It's an ox head, right? The next letter there is Shin. On the left-hand side, you see the modern letter on the right hand side you see what is the phoenician the the original uh, uh letter okay and that means uh shin means to consume with teeth destroy tear apart destroy so so far we've got son of god is destroyed then we get to yad yad is hand right and it even looks like a hand if you can look on it on the right hand side you see it looks like a hand that's stretched out yeah okay yad You've heard of yada, 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 right? Okay. And then the last is tav. Tav is the letter that's used as a mark for covenant. It's very, very interesting that long before Romans made crosses, the way that you made covenant with someone is you would make a mark. And you would make one mark and the other person would make the other mark. Okay? And it was tav. That meant covenant. Right? And so... Together, you can see that the very letters of the first word of the Old Testament is 
Son of God is destroyed by his hand on the cross. You see that? No amens. Let's go on. Amen. There's one. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> then you get to Genesis, uh, and, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test you here. Genesis 3.15. I've talked so much, I hope somebody knows it. What is the gospel story and the Jesus story in Genesis 3.15? God is speaking to Eve, and he says to Eve, what? Yes, the seed, your seed, the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman. Does women, does, do women have seed? That right there should give you, like, what? Okay, we're going to need a miracle now. So, so the incarnation of Jesus Christ is prophesied right away in Genesis 3.15 because a seed is going to come from a woman, the offspring of a woman. And women don't produce seed. Men do. Right? It's actually, this is probably too deep. We'll probably have to get to this at another time. But actually, uh, some scholars believe the transmission of sin is, it comes from Adam, through Adam. Because if you remember, Eve was the one deceived, correct? Not Adam. The Bible says that. Adam knew what God had said. He had to pass that along to Eve, right? So he went and ate. So in the New Testament, we're taught that Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. So the transmission of sin uh, was probably passed through man. So he says the seed of the woman, right? What's the seed of the woman going to do, Allison? Uh Uh-huh. Crush the serpent's head and the seed of the serpent. Uh huh. Bruce, his heel, right? So we have what's called the Proto Evangelium, the first gospel. Proto, first Evangelium gospel, right there in Genesis 3 15, right? That happened on the cross. How many times was Jesus called in the Old Testament a bruised reed? Three. Why bruised? I'm running out of time. I'm running out of time. Let's go to the next one. It's on your, it's on your handout. Genesis chapter 5. We have the genealogy of Adam. I referenced this a little bit Sunday morning. The genealogy of Adam. There's ten names in the genealogy of Adam. If you begin to interpret each of these Hebrew names, you're you're going to see another story. And this is what I want to leave with you tonight. The Old Testament is so beautiful because of a number of things. There's a layer, and then there's another layer, and then there's another layer, and there's another layer. And listen, that doesn't mean it gets deeper. That just means there's lots of layers. Don't go around thinking we got to get any deeper than we've got to get. There's just several layers to every story. And the deepest you'll ever get is Jesus. When you get to, when you get to the last layer and it's Jesus, you know you're at the last layer. You don't have to go any deeper than Jesus. Hello? Because there's these deeper leaper clubs. And we almost get into that in here a little bit, right? Where we're, get, we're so Pentecostal, we got a revelation that nobody else has. Listen, the revelation is Jesus. You know, when people say, well, I read the book of Revelations. Well, son, it's Revelation, not Revelations. And the revelation is Jesus. So don't get any deeper than that, all right? So in this genealogy, we see some names. We start with Adam. Adam means man in Hebrew. Seth means appointed, right? God appointed unto me a child. That's what Eve said. All right, Enosh, mortal. Kenan, sorrow. Mahaliel, the blessed God. So where we get the word L there. It's another name for God. Jared shall come down. Enoch, teaching. Um, there's an extra biblical book called the Book of Enoch. Very interesting. Um, it is not inspired by the Holy Spirit, but still very interesting. Okay? Uh, Methuselah, his death shall bring. By the way, when, what happened when Methuselah died? It rained. Isn't that interesting? Methuselah was named for that. Did you know that all the Old Testament names were prophetic? Every single one of them. All the way up to Jesus. His name, can I tell you that Jesus, his name was Old Testament too? We didn't have a New Testament until Jesus died. So his name was Old Testament too, all right? And his name is prophetic. Uh, Yeshua means 
Yeshua? Yeah, yeah. We say Jesus, but that's Greek nothingness. What's it mean in Hebrew? Yeshua. Deliverer. Deliverer. Right? Does he deliver? Yes, yes. Uh, Christos, Christos, or, or uh, Hamashiach. Hamashiach. Anointed king. Anointed. One is a heavenly name, one is an earthly name. Both, both of them are prophetic, right? The first time he came, he came to deliver. The second time he's come on. Yeah. See, it's prophetic. All right, good, 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 good. Is this okay tonight or is this too much? Okay. You know, sometimes you got to step up to the buffet, all right? All right, so uh, Methuselah's death shall bring Lamech, the despairing, Noah, rest or comfort. Here it goes. Man appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching and his death shall bring the despairing rest. Right there. Right there in the Old Testament. I didn't read the Old Testament. All right. Um, Let's stop with Melchizedek tonight because I got some other stuff. I think that's probably all I gave you. I I didn't give you Isaac and I didn't give you Joseph, did I? Okay, so we're going to stop with Melchizedek. We'll go home. Melchizedek. Oh, mysterious Melchizedek. Mel's Diner. Melchizedek. What do we know about Melchizedek? Is he in the Old Testament? Yes. Is he in the New Testament? Yes. So this is a perfect um, illustration, prototype, for talking about how the message of Jesus is in both the Old and New Testament. Both of them work together. All right? All right. Quick story. Quick story. We first run into Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis chapter 14, there are five kings that come down to attack four kings. Abram, at the time, that's his name, not Abraham. Abram raises up with 316 of his own men and goes to war with those five kings. Those five kings are attempting to attack the four kings. Out of the four kings, there are two kings that actually are Sodom and Gomorrah, right? The reason why Abram is defending those four kings is his nephew Lot and his family and all of his belongings, unfortunately, are in the world. That's what Sodom represents. The enemy, Satan, are in the world. Abram rises up to defend not Sodom and Gomorrah. He is defending his family. He's defending his nephew Lot, okay, and their family. He wins the battle when the other four kings run off. Abraham stays, or Abram stays with the 316 men. That's the original 300, okay? And they take on those five kings and they win. Here's the interesting thing that happens. Old Sodom, the king of Sodom, shows back up again. He's a wimp. He's a girly man, right? He shows up again and he says, you can have all the spoils now, Abram. You take the spoils. They're yours because you deserve it. You defended our kingdoms. They're yours. Abraham says no. He takes nothing from Sodom. That is pivotal for Christians because we are to come out of the world and not take anything from the world. Our God shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. I don't need anything from the world. I got my God. All right. So Abraham teaches that. And that is that's old and new covenant all the way. He meets a mysterious man that is a priest. He is a priest of Shalom, Salem, Salem. At the time, this is the city of peace, later named by David, Jerusalem. Jeru is city. Shalom, Salem is peace, city of peace. Hasn't had any peace in it. Won't have any peace in it until the king of peace, the prince of peace comes. Okay, he comes down and he offers Abraham two things. Abram, two things. What are they? Bread and wine. Thank you. Communion covenant he comes i want you to see what happens here okay he is a he is both a king and he is a priest no one after him except for jesus is both a king and a priest all right so later we have priests and we have kings but they don't get into each other's business they stay in their lane wouldn't it be great if churches acted that way stay in your lane right? Wouldn't it be great if we drove on highways that way? Stay in your lane. All right. And anytime the kings tried to do what the priests did, they'd get cursed. Anytime the priests tried to run the show and do what the kings did, they would get cursed. 
But Jesus came along and did both. Now, there's a little bit of, uh, I got to give, David kind of did both for a little while. But there's some messianic reasons. Anyway, he comes down, he's offering bread and wine. He is both a king and a priest. Let's look at his name. Mechael, king. Zedek comes from the uh, Yehovah Sikhanu. Uh, God is righteous, king of righteousness. Is this man righteous? Only if it's the pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. You want to know my version of it? It's Jesus. Jesus shows up a lot in the Old Testament. I'm telling you he's the fourth man in the fire. Okay? I'm telling you he's all over in the Old Testament. I'm telling you he's, he shows up in front of Manoah, who is now praying for a son with his wife, and a big shining light comes over the altar, and a bright flame, and they begin to worship at that place. It's not an angel, because the angel doesn't say stop, and then says, you're going to have a son, and his name shall be Samson, the bright and shining one, right? How about when, uh, how about when we, we see uh, uh, Moses passing on the baton there, and we've got a moment here where some people now are going to go in, and they're going to fight. And they have to go up against these cities. And Ai, and the one before Ai is what? Jericho, right? And there is an angel that appears to a man by the name of Yahshua, Joshua, right? And the angel says, uh, Joshua, oh, strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Says it to him three times. The Bible says that he worships there in the angel doesn't stop him. Why doesn't he stop him? Because he's a messenger. It's Jesus. It's not an actual angel. It's Jesus. I can show you Jesus again and again in the Old Testament, but why not show you here in Melchizedek? He comes down with bread and wine. He comes down. Didn't Jesus come down? He was transcendent. He became eminent. He became in, uh, in, uh, indigenous, meaning living with us, Emmanuel, God with us. Also, he, uh, he is incarnate, so he is born uh, as a man, and lives a life as a man, but dies as a man in our place for God. And here is the king of righteousness. He comes down, he offers bread and wine. Where does he go to offer this to Abram? The Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley. For your notes, what is the big deal with the Kidron Valley? Let me tell you, it is where David in the 23rd Psalm said, Hmm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Kidron means death shadow. I was there. I can tell you what it looks like. There's lots of graves there now, but it wasn't at that time. It wasn't at that time. That was the place you went to and you crossed over when you left the upper room, right? And you marched towards the Mount of Olives and you stopped at the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the place Jesus walked through and came down to. You see, Jesus had to walk down the mountain. Melchizedek walked down the mountain. Jesus gave communion. Melchizedek gave communion, right? Jesus walks down the mountain, comes through the valley of the shadow of death, ends up at the foot of the Mount of Olives. And where is he? He's at the Garden of Gethsemane. I want to go ahead and break down the names here. Machael, or Mache. Uh, Zedek, king of righteousness, the Messiah, uh, is the anointed king. We see in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 2, he is the king of righteousness. We see all throughout the Old Testament, Jesus is called the Christ. I, I want to give you something quickly before you go. Sometimes you'll see Paul mention Christ first, and sometimes you'll see in the Gospels, you'll see Jesus Christ. You'll see Jesus' name first, right? Or you'll see Paul switch it and put Christ first. Because Paul is looking, watch this, Paul is looking on this side of the cross, come on. <laughs> and in the Gospels, they're looking at this side of the cross, right? I wish I had more time, but I, I, I could elaborate. But we see uh, uh, Melchizedek, he is a uh, priest of the Most High God. Hebrews calls Jesus the eternal high priest. We see in Hebrews, Melchizedek is called both king and priest. Jesus is the same. But in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 6. No Torah genealogy. Um, most of the people in the Old Testament, their genealogy is given. It's very important. Um, there's no father or mother. There's no son of anything with Melchizedek. There's probably a good reason why. John chapter 1 verse 1 calls Jesus the eternal word of God. Right? We get a genealogy, but it's only for his human, uh, human part. All right? 
uh, we see that uh, before him and greater than the Levite priesthood. So he's greater than bef- he's before the Levite priesthood and he's greater than the Levite priesthood. Hebrews chapter seven. And of Jesus, he has a greater adovah. That's worship work. That's the work of worship than the high priest and the altar at the tabernacle. Under Melchizedek, based on the word of oath or promises of God. Jesus, based on the eternal priesthood and the promises of God. He offered bread and wine to Abraham. Jesus offered bread and wine. Abraham paid tithes as worship, pre-law, by the way. All right? Believers pay tithe and worship, post-law, by the way. So, David says this. Psalms 23, verse 4. I'll close with this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, right? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Let's go back to Abraham and I'll explain what David is writing about there. We go back to Abraham. Abram is in the Kidron Valley. He's in the valley of the shadow of death. He has just fought evil kings, right? He is presented with communion, bread and wine from Melchizedek. This is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. And here is the big explosion. He's not there alone and neither is Melchizedek. Guess who else is there with Abraham? The king of Sodom. Sodom is the devil. Sodom represents evil. Sodom represents the world. Guess where the world and evil and the devil show up? Every place that God wants to bless you. (laughs) Every time God shows up to bless you, the devil shows up to curse you. Hello? The devil doesn't go, well, they're blessed, boys. Back off. Back off, guys. God's blessing them. I guess we'll lose. As soon as God... So you need to turn it around. When you begin to see hardship in your life, this is what David means. He says, in the Kidron Valley, in the valley of the shadow of death, that's exactly where Abraham got the blessing. He got blessed by Melchizedek in the valley of the shadow of death. And Melchizedek prepared a table for him in the presence of his enemies. Hello? The real enemy was Sodom, not the other four kings. They were defeated. Hello? Now, now, now hold on to this. You want God to prepare a table. You just don't want any presence of enemies. But enemies are the exact indication that God has showed up, that God wants to bless you, and his blessing is coming through Jesus. So you know it's got to be good. You know it's good, right? And so the next time it's a valley, the next time you're in a place where you feel like, man, this is as dark as it gets, understand this, God knows that, and that's just the place of promotion, pain, promotion, in the same place. Hardship, holiness, in the same place. God is doing something there. But if you go and you take the spoils from Sodom, if you go and you take the spoils from the world or the enemy, you're going to miss out on the blessing that comes from the king of righteousness. Hold out, church. Hold out for the blessing of God. That's what the Old Testament is teaching us. Now, I could tell you about Isaac. It's all about Jesus. His whole story is about, I mean, the way he carried the wood up the side of the mountain. You know where he died? Moriah. You know where Moriah is? Right next to Golgotha. Abraham seen at Moriah. He seen the sacrifice of the Lord. It's not just talking about a ram, but by the way, the ram was caught by, by thorns. His head was caught by thorns in a bush over and over and over and over again. God's saying, it's about my son, Jesus, about my son, Jesus. When you open your Bible, don't go, oh, get past that. And grab like, you know, a salad bunch of books and just go. And oh, Matthew. Look for Jesus. He's in there and he's wanting to bless you. Even in even in the darkest valleys of your life and in the darkest moments of God's word. He's there to bless you. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. And somebody close tonight, if you would.